Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Carger. I am the chief correspondent at Fandango. I'm very happy to see such a full room tonight for this beautiful film. And it is my distinct pleasure to say, please welcome Alicia Vikander. Thank you so much. Wow. wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. Really. <laughs> okay, so let me start with the most important thing which I've learned in conversations with you and Eddie Redmayne and Tom Hooper about this film. You supposedly were the dog's favorite. <laughs> How did you At become the- At the beginning, the... really. <laughs> well, um, the dog was Tom's favorite of the three of us. Yes. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, I remember, uh, you as actors, you know, you come in and it's the first week and you're really just, <laughs> really just freaked out. And Eddie and I was kind of reassuring every, you know, each other between every take, like, no, but it feels like it's going well and you're great. And and then and then uh, uh, Tom steps in and is like, oh yeah, the editor, you know, called. He's he's done the first couple of scenes of the film. He says the dog's great. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like. And then nothing else came, and he was like, thumbs up. <laughs> so, yeah. When I heard that story, I was surprised the dog even made it into the movie at that point, but I think the dog's role got bigger and bigger as it the went on. The dog had three auditions. <laughs> How many did you have? Oh, probably about the same. Really? <laughs> Where would you put this on the scale of parts that you wanted the most? Very, very high. Um, I... I had heard about this film or this project for a while. I actually, um, this project has been in the making for about 15 years. Gail Mutrix, our tireless producer, so had worked great. so many years to get this. It was not an easy story to finance and to get made. And um, I, I did have some friends who had been involved in this film. So I kind of had heard in the industry. And it was also a script um, by Lucinda Coxman that a lot of people had read. It was one of those blacklists that people talked about. And mm -hmm. um, when I then read the script, I think I had probably the similar reaction to most people. And I was just blown away by this incredible love story between these two pioneering women mm -hmm. who went through uh, this transition almost 100 years back when there was uh, no reference of it and um, and I it was it was the same year I read two films that I've been able to do and that was Danish Girl and Ex Machina and I must say both of those films are just as a script as um, its own product is the best pieces I've read so far. What tactics do you use for yourself in a case like this where you hear about something, you read something, and you know you want it? How do you make sure that you're putting your best foot forward and not letting the pressure of it, the stress of it, get to you? Oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I think it always does. Um, I, I don't know. It, it, I, I, in one way, I was a bit fortunate because it's a lot of times when you, you have been in that situ situation and I w walked into um, uh, an audition and it's, it's never like filming. Mm. It, or I find it a very different animal to go and do castings. You come in and you have this camera in front of you and you maybe have five to 15 minutes or whatever. I was very lucky on this um, project that I, that Tom wanted to just meet me. I knew I was definitely not the only one when they were casting 
uh, a lot of girls at this time, but he wanted just to sit down and chat and talk. And that just takes away a bit of all that, all that your nerves that you do have coming in. And, you know, I just wanted him to know how much I adore this script and I wanted to talk about it and about the role. But of course, then I also got a chance to hear whatever thought he had about the character and, and for him to give me some keys to kind of think about and that I could then use when I did my first audition with him. And then when I was lucky enough to get a call back and, uh, come in for a chemistry read with Eddie Redmayne. Um, and um, he was, both of them actually, I, I remember in the room where I came in and they, it's obvious that they've done two films already together and they're good friends, but they were like really came in and were like, oh, we, you know, Eddie, I remember Eddie said, I was like, I know you're shit nervous and I'm too and we're going to work it out and we just sit down and we, you know, so it was a very kind of um, warm feeling from the start. Well, you just answered my next question, which was what is it like to be kind of the new person in this group of three? Because it seems as if Tom and Eddie have the this... The dog, so we were already right, exactly. a trio. Four, right. <laughs> <laughs> Once you were on the set, did they also go out of their way to make it comfortable for you, given the fact that they had this history together? Uh, it's not at already there in the, in, the, um, in the casting room when I, when I met them for that reading. Um, and then, because uh, we met... It was almost seven months, eight months before we actually started to shoot when I got the role. I was going to do a, another film first and, um, and, and um, that gave us a chance to kind of meet up in the summer mm. just before we all went and did other things to just, we had six days when we came in and had breakfast at 8 a.m. and left about 9 p.m. and Lucinda, uh, the writer even came. I've never had a writer who's so both on pressures uh, about a script that is so good mm -hmm. and you kind of want to honor that and yet she wanted to like, no, 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 but let me come in and we can talk about things and figure out ways or rewrite scenes to get, I mean, that, it was so incredible. I've never had that experience before. So we had that week to kind of also get to know each other, which was great. You're You've had this situation that I kind of compare to Jessica Chastain a few years ago where she basically had filmed like six movies and for various reasons, none of them had come out. And then in this like nine month space of time, all of these movies came out and it was like, ooh, Jessica Chastain. Meanwhile, she'd been working steadily for th three years. I think something similar has happened to you where we've seen you in four or five things um, that you probably filmed over a period of time and now they're all coming out. Where did this fall as far as having done Ex Machina? Had you already filmed that when you got this part? Yes. You must have been um, like, oh, just, yeah, Watch it wasn't. It, yeah, it wasn't out. Um, I, I remember that um, Tom. I think he had been chatting with uh, Alex Garland, so he actually director. had seen. Yes, the uh, director of um, Ex Machina. So he saw a, a leg cut of the film. Oh. Um, um, but no, and uh, Danish Girls Out, and the film that I did just before, uh, is probably going to come out in a year. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, you never really know <laughs> how long they're going to be in post. When I did uh, one of these talks a couple weeks ago with Eddie and Tom, we spoke a lot about Eddie's, uh, the, the physical attributes of his portrayal, the, the body language. And Tom was very quick to point out that that was something that was important to you as well, to change your body language to become Gerda. I'm curious to know what were you trying to accomplish with that? Um, it was actually, it's sweet of Tom to bring up that. He was kind of, the, he was definitely the one who gave me the key. I mean, I think because I, I used to dance for quite many years and maybe, well, in Ex Machina, maybe more consciously, I, I did think about it, but normally it's just probably part of how I work and I don't normally think so much how I physically go into it, but um, Tom and I sat down and chatted and he said, well, I want because it, it is such a physical transformation that Eddie had already seen. He was working so hard on that on, during rehearsals. And he was like, I, I don't want to lose Gerda's character with that. I want her to become a very own you know, persona and, and her own character and very defined. And we talked then about physicality. And I, I, I thought it was such a... Um, Gerda is a very um, giving and... Um, extremely loving and supporting person. Mm. And what I love is that, I don't know if it's, sometimes 
those things are uh, people think are equal with being like passive because you're just giving and giving. But instead, I think it's such um, um, shows the ability of not being scared. So it's such a strength within that. And it was already in the words in the script. This ability of just always pushing forward, always having a drive and a, a very very big sense of. Um, uh, I don't know, force about her. Mm. So I think but whilst talking about that and during rehearsals, we actually had two weeks, two and a half, so I've never had that long um, in prepping for a role uh, or a film with the actors. Uh, and, and then we just tried to find her kind of being on her feet all the time. And that really helped me to kind of find the, I don't know, um, I don't know, she, she just always, I, I don't know, I, I liked uh, mm. when I found that physicality. Mm. One of the things that's so powerful to me when I watch this movie is to see Goethe's reaction to what starts out kind of as a game. You know, the, uh, Einer becoming Lily at this party and, and then to watch it kind of spiral out of Goethe's control and become this thing that becomes quite upsetting at a certain point. Why do you think Goethe suggested that Lily go, that Einar go to the ball as Lily in the first place? Do you think it was just for fun, not realizing what it would become? I find if you, um, if you, you know, I'm, I think I'm a big <laughs> romantic somewhere deep down, and I think if you care for somebody, if you really love somebody, if you think you know that person, you start to unconsciously have a, an ability to see the, what that real person is mm. and, 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 and the inner person. Um, and then I think what I loved with Lucinda's script was that it's, it's one way Gerda, through her art, who kind of brings out Lily the first time. And, mm. uh, it's because of the love and, and, and the trust between them that, that she's able to share that. Uh, so in one way, I think it's her subconscious um, that has already have a feeling of knowing who the person that she loves is. Mm. And, and that game kind of spins out of that. And also, in preparation for this role, I just when I found information about these two women, it's like just finding photographs of them. They're so artistic and so wild. It's like I found photos of them trying just different outfits and being in different scenes and throwing themselves on different sofas. And I mean, they just seem like, I don't know, artist or I, I as an actor kind of related to it. And, mm. and that game was just in those photographs that we found. And I, I, I could just so easily visualize um, this thing. And it, it, because it is game, it, it, it makes them, um, I, I love it because th through the game, the kind of truth more easy can come out for, for both of them, I think. Tom was explaining to me that he really wanted to play with color in this film, which I think is just so vivid. I mean, every shot in this film feels like a painting to me, uh, right? So I had a bit of a sh shock when I walked into this um, uh, to the set the first day. Uh, we had worked with tape marks for two weeks, knowing exactly where the doors were and all that. Uh, a bit like Dogville, uh, that film of Las Matria. Um, uh, and, uh, then I came in, and I, uh, I'm, I'm Swedish, grew up in Sweden, and uh, we have in Denmark uh, an artist that is quite or very well known in, in Scandinavia called Hammershoi. And some of the frames you've seen in this film are almost direct copies of this artist. You need to look him up. He's actually now when I had a Q and A in New York a few weeks ago, we put that in. They've actually put his work up um, at a museum in New York, and 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 um, it's that thing of um, um, it's all about the colors, the kind of grays, the blue shades, um, um, the, the long corridors, and it was so much of that kind of shell of wanting to get out and then the contrast of when we arrived at the set for um, the Paris sequence. By the way, uh, our designer, she bought that on eBay. Um, she actually Googled in uh, Paris flat, early 20th century, and that was the first thing that came up. Wow. 
I really thought it was a joke when it came in big boxes. And they actually now resold it on eBay. Wow. <laughs> I love that. Tell me a little bit about, there are some scenes of such tremendous intimacy in this film. What were those days like for you as far as the set atmosphere? Were there fewer people on the set? Was that important to you? Um, it's always just really tough doing um, scenes like um, that for, for technical reasons. Um, but then reading the scripts is when you realize, I mean, it comes down to a story you want to tell. And in this scene, it's a love story. So, and also the kind of really, I, I thought the scene, when I read it on, on the page, the scene where Lily has tried on the slip and she buttoned down the shirt and that just moment of no one knowing what the, you know, just the next second will take them or, you know, if it's gonna be a big change in their relationship and their lives, you know, it's, so uh, it, it, that was a very important scene and um, um, so I think it's, it, it is, uh, every time I've done scenes like that, uh, I, it's always uh, down to much fewer people on set and you just know really by, it's, it's not improvisation which you can't maybe normally have in other scenes, it's all kind of just played out. Mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, I actually talked to um, both <laughs> Eddie and um, uh, uh, Tom about the fact, because I did have a dancing background, I was like, let's just do a choreography and we stick to that, and that just makes it a bit easier. I'm sure it does. <laughs> Did, was there a scene that you were particularly excited to shoot, one that you were most looking forward to? Uh, oh. I don't know, um, I have this thing, I don't know if any of you have similar, I, um, when I get, you never know if a schedule's gonna change, well it always does, that you know. Uh, and I um, normally put like different stars on my scenes, like one, two, or three, like three is something, you know, a scene that I really am quite freaked out about, nervous, <laughs> and, and it, you know, it could be that, and that normally means that I'm really excited for it too. Okay. So it's like the tough thing of it's a scene that I've pressured, or uh, treasured, mm -hmm. sorry, my, my foreign <laughs> language, um, um, uh, treasured a lot, so then I'm excited for it, but also very nervous, so I kind of put them in the calendar, so I was like, oh, Wednesday next week, that's when that scene, you, know, you kind of start to count down the days for that day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that was um, this scene um, when Gerda, I mean, it's not, it was a tough scene, when Gerda comes back from the gallery and meets Lily in the Paris uh, apartment and mm. they both really, really want to connect and, and she's afraid of losing him and the kind of um, complexity and wanting to or having to spell out, I really want my husband back, whilst knowing who the person she loves really is mm. and knows that that's not the truth. And almost like both wanting to reach out, both having to be honest and also feeling maybe guilt mm. for knowing that they're now quite distant, you know. That, so that was a scene that I really um, looked forward and feared. Mm. It's been such a remarkable couple of years for visibility of transgender people in our country, in the world. What was the status of things in that regard when you got this part? And what has it been like for you to see it, this tipping point that everyone's talking about, to see that happen over the other months? It's been so interesting, especially since um doing press for this film or sitting here talking about it, that, that this question comes up or it's a lot of people who have um, said, well, this is a film of now. Or, um, and, and, and the thing is that just when I came on, I, I'm being the real newbie uh, for them working so many years. But it, was, it wasn't in the zeitgeist just one and a half year ago when I came on. Um, and it's been remarkable to see, you know, Caitlyn Jenner or Transparent or um, uh, all the things in media that has happened over the last year, or well, just a few months, really. Um, and uh, Tom and I had this amazing experience of being just invited to be visitors, really, for... Um, by the way, you have a president 
who is the first one who ever to use the word transgender. Uh, and he honored a lot of people in, from the LGBT community a few weeks ago in the White House. And we were there and saw some of the panels of, of people who maybe never thought in their lifetime that they were gonna be able to just be themselves mm. publicly. And now they were able to kind of be there at the White House and, and talk about what they did for lifting up those discussions and questions. And, um, and, and that was pretty extraordinary. Mm. I'm sorry in advance that I don't know the answer to this question, but are there relatives, descendants of family members of Lily or Gerda, you know, of other branches of their family tree, who have seen this film and given feedback on it? Um, not that I know of, no. Um, for, for, for us, I think it's been you know, the friends and dear people who we've been really close to, I think, in preparing for this film. I think that was um, something we all took very seriously in, in wanting to be uh, authentic to this role because of, I mean, every single person's story is different, and that's also when you realize when uh, both Eddie and I met a lot of people from the transgender community, and I of course, for preparing for God, I met a lot of people who were the friends or loved ones or partners, partners who've left, past, who are not together, partners who are still with a partner after transitioning. And, and, and to hearing all these stories and the generosity that people um, you know, came with was incredible. I, I remember I had this, um, I read a book called My Husband is a Woman Now written by a woman, Leslie Fabians, and I, I just really, because her book and her, she is still with her partner, Deborah, after transitioning, and her book, when I read it, was like, probably my strongest inspiration uh, for Gerda, because she had that kind of force that I talked about before, and honesty, and, and honesty that comes through in telling all the different sides of what it is like to uh, have, have gone through this and also wanted to point out that it was as much of a transition for her and, and calling her up. I just wanted to thank her and I was like, hi, I'm Alicia Vikanda, I'm an actress and I just want to tell you how much your book meant to me. And, and, and she said, and we had never met, <laughs> and she just said, well, you know, Alicia, you can ask me anything. Mm. Like really just anything. And Suddenly, I just found myself in a situation when I, I got nervous because I, that is not a situation you're normally put through with that kind of generosity and, mm. and openness from someone you've never met. And, and we ended up being on the phone for a few hours. And, she, and that was in several cases. I know that Eddie met a lot of people like that too. Mm. And, and, and all those people. Um, to have them come in and see the film was pretty extraordinary. Okay, so I'm go uh, the audience members have have uh, written some questions down for you. you. So I'm going to um, read some of my favorites. Now, I, am, am I right that it's Ren Harris? Your handwriting is like my favorite thing I've ever seen. I want you all to experience Ren's oh handwriting. God, you should see mine. It's, it's so bad, and I had to try and paint in this film. <laughs> it wasn't good. <laughs> I just want to like live in a house that's decorated by your handwriting. <laughs> and, your qu and your question's great, too. I'm not just picking it because the handwriting's great. Uh, so, Alicia, uh, Ren wants to know, so far in your career, you've gotten to play some spectacularly diverse characters, which is incredibly true which isn't always an easy thing for actors to do. How do you go about deciding on a role and what obstacles have you had to overcome as a woman in the film industry? So let's take this bit by bit. So has it been a conscious a decision to you to, to take roles that are a little bit more edgy and out there? First of all, in the beginning, it's, you know, I've been fortunate now to be given a chance to uh, get to read several scripts, but also in the beginning, I was very lucky to go up for parts that I cared for, but then, of course, to just to be chosen to be part of them. Um, but, um, no, I've, I think it's that excitement and joy when you've been given the chance to do something that you've never done before. And I think I do get ex more excited than normally if I have a script, which I don't really know how I'm going to... Uh, 
um, dug my teeth into it, I, you know. Uh, and um, I think um, that fear and being a bit nervous about entering a new role and see how far you can stretch yourself, how far, how far away you can go from yourself or any character you've done before. Um, um, that excitement I really like. And I also really, really enjoy the preparation work. And that comes with that, to, to try and see if you can find something new. And have there been specific obstacles being female in this business? Well, there's not as many female roles. <laughs> it takes quite a lot of scripts before um, um, I've read. I, I've been very lucky. I've done some very, very strong roles, uh, or so, uh, portrayed some very, very strong women that are complex. So they're, they're definitely out there, and I think there's a change. I think over just, I've been working um, now for six, seven years in, in, in movies, and I, I feel just over the last, over those years, that it's now seeing young women and girls up on the screen even showing that they can be as much of a commercial success or um, seeing that it's a lot more of those female, strong, diverse parts in the scripts um, um, is a reality. Uh, but then I know that it was written in an <laughs> interview I did that it was f five films that I hadn't been in a woman, but it, uh, it was actually the fourth when I realized I was in um, a film for the first time uh, having a scene with another woman. So I did three films in a row as a female lead and not having one scene with a woman. Um, That's crazy. Yes. <laughs> okay. Something that screenwriters should, can think about. <laughs> okay, so here's a question from Stephen Bailey. We touched on part of this, but I like the second part of his question, which is uh, with regards to Tom Hooper. What did you learn from him, from working with him? He is a director that just has such an overview of all the pieces of filmmaking. Um, he is what we really care about. He's very much a director who cares about his actors. I mean, it already started with that um, long um, uh, rehearsal period that I know he fought for, because there's never time, there's never money. Mm. Uh, and uh, he was always so, uh, I thought it was brilliant that he, he kind of always wanted to push me and Eddie to always try everything just by ourselves first and kind of have that as the beginning, which is, um, you've been giving a lot of trust, but also I love that he let us just go with whatever our gut feeling was and then he kind of, I felt when we did a scene and I knew he was by the monitor, it was lovely when he came in and of course because Eddie and I are like face to face and sometimes very close, we can, it's, it's almost like we try to feel, we can see that we're heading somewhere but we can't really find it. And then he comes in and he gives us like one single note and I realize that he's been actually seeing what we're doing and that is kind of, that, that is emotional intelligence. Mm. Um, um, so uh, I really loved working with him, but then also to see what he knew about, you know, from a visual point. Uh, he knew exactly, he's, um, he's so articulate in, in explaining his frames and how he works and, um, and like comes down to talking about color. That was already something that he brought up early in the rehearsal um, room. So I love that he just, he's very close to everyone on set. And here's a question from George. George wants to know, what is your first step in developing a character after you read the script? Uh, I think it's... You put stars next to the scenes. I we know, that's the first thing, the that's the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's so interesting when I talk about preparing for the roles and I said I really, you know, I love that period of time, but it's also, I, I love filmmaking because of the communal feeling of getting to know a group that you're gonna work with, because that is what it is. And, and for every single film, it becomes a very different thing because of the filmmaker at the heart of it. The director kind of sets a tone of how he wants to work and sometimes it can just be a lot of conversations, sometimes it's up on your feet, sometimes it's um, uh, inspiration. And I think uh, part from me, because I need quite many hours to learn my lines, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so that is probably maybe mm -hmm. like the first thing I just on the first day start to really just read everything out loud. Uh, and that just helps me also to, I think, just kick off my imagination, whatever. It's like reading a book. I think if it's a good script, my, my imagination just starts spinning immediately. But then when I read the script out loud in my room just by myself, each time I'm, new thoughts come to me while having the words in my mouth. So I think that's maybe one of the things I just do on, on my part, which then, of course, becomes very different when I get into the room with the people I'm going to work with. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing I want to know is how would you say you've changed after making this film? I imagine this has probably had a bigger impact on you than some, than the average film. I've been very lucky to have a lot of films that have been special, but it, yes, this has been very rare because of all the, the personal connection, the, the people that I've met, the friends that I've, I've got, um, um, to, to know that uh, you're telling a story that means so much uh, for for people, and and that it was a story that, I mean, I was just quite blown away by the fact that this that I didn't know about Lily Elb and Gerda Vena, um, uh, that they were those two women, the, the pioneers of that time, going through what they did already in the 1920s. I did not know mm. that the first. Um, Generation assignment was back then. And, and that kind of just to me showed, I don't know if it's the kind of prejudice of society who kind, of, kind of suppress these kind of stories and and whatever whatever reason it was, um, um, th this was a story that had to be um, told. Well, I think I speak for everyone when we say we're glad that we all know about it now. And I'm glad that it's led to your first Screen Actors Guild Award nomination. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. <laughs>